guys, welcome back to the final episode of this book presentation. Um, it's been a while. I did the first three videos in Amsterdam in January, and uh, I've been so busy working on the cabins here. So, but let's get to it. You, what you just saw was Ayacucho. It was a little festival which I basically bumped into. I didn't <laughs> didn't know it was there. And this whole area is very interesting. Um, the Sacred Valley, Cusco, this colonial town built on the remains of the Incan Empire and Machu Picchu. Like so this the stories there are so rich and you're at the edge of the Andes and the steamy mountains which go down into the jungle. So it's very green and humid. And then you have the Rainbow Mountains there too, which is this area of high altitude, beautifully colored mountains, all kind of like purple and red. Uh, it's a difficult place to be because it's so high up. This height goes up to 5,000. But it's incredibly beautiful. The people there, the indigenous local uh, farmers that are herding uh, alpacas on those high altitudes and those super colorful garments. Um, it's an incredible part of the world, the south of Peru. And um, as I was heading south, the rain season dried up. It's also a much more uh, drier area, the south of Peru. And it's the high point of my journey, both literally and metaphorically speaking. This is so amazing. It's near 4,800 meters. It's a bit like Rainbow Mountains, but in a different flavor. It's more like blue, aqua colors, and green. It's interesting because these places are photographically stunning, but physically it's very demanding and also mentally you are just so alone and so vulnerable out there that it is like kind of like sometimes I think I do it for the photos. It's, it's kind of a paradox. Um, because many times I'm there, I'm sort of excited, but I want to get away as fast as possible because I'm, I'm not happy to be there. Um, it has to do also in your state of mind, if you're okay to, to be alone for a long time. Most of the time I am, like 95% of the times I don't feel alone at all, but I do feel alone when I've, uh, I've spent some time with people. I've, established more of a connection sometimes a deeper connection and I'm in this process of letting go again sometimes it takes a bit longer and if you're then in these kind of places hauntingly beautiful it's it's sometimes difficult it it feels like a paradox I was heading to this place called Texani Volcan Texani, it's a beautiful volcano and I was going to climb to the top because the snow had dried up which is at 5450 meters um, so I got up I was camping at 4950 and sort of underneath a rock which gave some shelter for the wind and this place is like it's almost it looks like Mars it's it's very deserted it's just rocks and sand and I, I couldn't sleep because on these altitudes it's very difficult to get to sleep because all the, it, the air is so dry and the, yeah, there's almost no oxygen so all the liquids in your head kind of dry up as you're trying to sleep and it's you get dizzy um, 
I got up at 2.30, it was still dark, and I was just making some food, and I started the hike up. And at sunrise, I reached the top. It was incredibly beautiful. It's the highest place I've ever been. I stayed a few days in La Paz, which is the highest capital in the world, together with El Alto, which is its neighboring city at 4,000 meters. And um, it's a cool city because you can travel around using these cable cars. There's a few lines that cover the entire city and you just hover above the chaos. It's, it's quite amazing. And it's, it's quite a contrast with going out of the city. Uh, using the roads because it's just full with minibuses and traffic. It's just madness. It's different from cities in North America and Europe where the traffic is a bit more regulated. You have the freeways for cars only, fast traffic, and then you might have bike lanes in, in European cities. But here, everything is on the main highway. Buses, minibuses, cars, pedestrians, animals, it's just everyone is trying to find its way to where they need to be. It's kind of both equally fun and stressful to get out of the city on a bike like that because it takes almost a full day once you're really out of the city. Tailwind, it's going pretty fast. I might break my personal record today, which is 154 kilometers uh, on a loaded touring bike. I left La Paz this morning, not very early, but I might be able to do more than 150 today. I keep cruising like this, this is really nice. tire just exploded I think it was empty in seconds so I'm gonna try to fix it but I'm afraid it's exploded um, yeah so I left La Paz two times on my way to the salt lakes because um, the first time my uh, my tire exploded it was a very big hole in the tire so I, I needed to get back. I hitchhiked with a little bus and at the bike shop they glued in a piece of plastic, <laughs> quite a big piece from a PET bottle and over that uh, a big piece of rubber on the inside of the tire and um, it was I was good again. I was running tubeless but then the second day out of La Paz it happened again in another location. I think there must have been some glass on the, on the road. And uh, I lost a lot of sealant, but eventually the sealant fixed the hole. So I was good uh, and I headed on towards the salt lakes. Um, Salada Uyuni, the biggest salt lake in the world. I'm just looking how far it was from La Paz. Because in the back of the book you have the cycling log, which shows how much distance I had cycled every day. So. It's a whole list here. So La Paz, 13,000. Yeah, that's about 300, 400 kilometers. Salado Uyuni was high on my bucket list for a very long time, even before the journey. And it's just this incredible white open space. Um, it was going to take me about two or three days to entirely cross it. And um, I wasn't sure it was dried up because it, it's there's like half a meter of water in the rain season and I was just just after the rain season. So um, the middle is first dry and then the edges are still a little bit wet but you can get on it. 
and it was simply spectacular. And when I was a few kilometers in, I, the amount of sunlight and reflecting light on the soul just made me dizzy. And it was kind of warm too, it was strange. At 3300 meters, um, there was no wind, it was extremely quiet. And I had a little break there to just boil an egg and get some food inside because I was feeling dizzy. This is how you eat an egg on the salad. That's your salt. Nice. Salty eggs. It's hard to describe. I mean, this. You're really lost in time and space as you cycle because you. There's no. There's no progress, no visible progress. Um, sometimes I just looked at my phone at the dot to see where I was and what my progress was, because that's the only thing you will, you can kind of see to calculate the distance. Another day in the Salt Lake. It's so incredibly beautiful. The moon just came up. Um, I think today's a full moon or tomorrow, but it looks pretty full to me. Sunset. This is such a huge place. Amazing sunsets. It's the second night. Uh, and this night I'm gonna sleep actually here on the salt. Let's see if I can smooth this out a bit. looking for words to explain how amazing this is I was just running around this this is so big and so incredibly beautiful this vast open air you know and the moon is right above me which lights up this wide open space my little tent and my bicycle I've cycled here so quiet so large it's like the clouds are surrounding me it looks like the clouds are everywhere everywhere there and they rise up and then there's this open black space here and the moon Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's it is it's the most beautiful place I've come. It's, it's so special. It's just salt, a flat horizon, and a sky. That's just what it is. I'm trying to hear something, but it's all in my head. There's nothing here. It's nothing.
I still burn. I burn by the reflection probably of the salt. Um, yesterday I uh, cycled without my jacket and my shirt. I just burned instantly. It hurts so bad in the night. So that's why I'm keeping my head up. But even with my head, I just burn from this side and this side. So this is the last day. Um, it's been quite amazing. Three days on the salt. It's going a little bit slower than I thought, but it's only 15 kilometers that way. Then there will be will be a town, uh, Kochani, I think, and after that Uyuni, where I'll take a break and then head further south. Ah, it's really beautiful. I really enjoy this. All right, let's move on. <sighs> The rest of my time through Bolivia was just equally breathtaking. Um, this whole area is just about 4,500 meters and it's just otherworldly. There's geysers everywhere, salt lakes, mineral lakes, it's all desert. Nobody lives there. There's a few refugios that are there for tourism basically, but nobody, nobody permanently lives there. And um, it's a rough ride. It's all those washboard, sandy roads, but it's it's breathtakingly beautiful. The same paradox as in in Peru. It's just beautiful, but tough to be on a bicycle. moment of profound happiness when I entered Chile because the roads are much better there so after days on washboard roads I crossed the border and the road was paved beautifully paved road and it was all going down from 4800 meters to 2200 meters San Pedro de Atacama, which is a lovely tourist town with great restaurants, a really nice hotel, so it's a nice place to have a little break there. And um, I remember just crossing the border and going down, it, the sun was setting, this long downhill road, and I had the feeling I could see the entire country, and I had the feeling I could see the end of the journey, it was a beautiful moment. Um, of sort of arriving home, sort of arriving into safety and comfort. He invited me in his room, no money, just being friendly. From here on, it was slowly getting easier and I was starting to see the end. Slowly, because it was still 6,000 kilometers to go. 
Uh, but the highest parts were behind me and Argentina and Chile are more European countries. They're more developed, so there's better restaurants, better food, great wine. Uh, especially in the north of Argentina, you got this beautiful combination of still high altitude and these red desert, but in combination with vineyards and there's a lot of parrots, like the green parrots there. And um, yeah, it's, it's easier, it's beautiful. Uh, the climate was quite nice too, uh, still sort of summerish, lower altitude. You know, sometimes you're cycling through a place and you think like, why have I never heard of this before? They would be a national park if it would be in the US or Canada or, or Europe. But in South America, there's so many places still unexplored or they are known to the, to the region, of course, or to the country, but they're not internationally famous as, for example, Zion National Park or any other national park. And I kind of like that idea. It makes the travel more special and unique and, and not everything has to be shared and location tagged. Um, it's good to keep things sort of a little secret. Um, I had some trouble with my tire because the wire bead broke loose. I think I pumped it up too hard when I was in Peru because these big tires, you're not supposed to add too much pressure to it. So I was stitching it all the time and I needed to cycle on low pressure. It was hard because I wanted to make some distance. Um, and every time it tear out further. So I was just sitting there stitching it. <laughs> Okay, this was stitched last time. It has glue on it. Oh, sorry. There. Now this part's come out. There you go. So you get a, a big bubble here. As I was gaining distance southwards, uh, it was slowly becoming winter and it was slowly becoming more recognizable. I was really seeing the end and I was having trouble to stay focused because I thought the high point of the journey was behind me and I thought I had seen it all. I've been through deserts, I've been through on the highest mountain pass, the deepest gorges, through the jungle. I, I, I thought I was ready, but there was still a few thousands of kilometers to do. So it was difficult to be in the moment and it happened very often that I thought, I, I don't want to do this. Maybe spending life on the bike is just not so nice. And um, because it is not so nice if you're not really into cycling, you know, I, I felt I was done. But I had to move on because I didn't want to be the guy that almost cycled to Patagonia. I needed to finish it for myself. I needed to dive into winter. Again, I was traveling off season. It was getting colder and colder. Um, so I teamed up with Sophie and Jeremy, uh, a couple from France. I knew they were doing a similar journey and we'd been in touch, but we never had cycled together. Uh, so this was a good opportunity to sort of breathe new life into the journey. So we cycled together for some days and we stayed in close contact. Not, not every day, there were sections they did it on their own and I, I did my own routes. Uh, but we kept meeting up, which was really nice camping together, uh, sharing stories together. Um, but winter was rough. The last big adventure was Paso Maya, which is a border crossing from Chile to Argentina, uh, the last part of the Carretera Austral, 
It's a beautiful road through remote mountains and nature and uh, it's a popular destination in summer. I was there in winter and in summer there's more options to cross the border, there's ferries going, there's just more ways. In winter there's nobody there, it's just quiet. And there's this one border crossing uh, which is basically for locals, farmers, because you cannot go there by car or by motorized traffic because there's a passarela, uh, a cable bridge, this narrow, like very narrow. And um, I was with Sofen and Jeremy before, I was cycling together for a few days, but they were ahead of me because I was, I don't know, I was doing some things on my laptop and I need to finish that morning. So, so they were basically half a day or a day ahead of me. And I wasn't sure if I was going to meet them. And the weather just got so bad, it was just raining and raining and the rivers were high. There were multiple streams I had to cross, but it was just you know, there was so much water. It was so miserable. Uh, yeah, it was quite a memory. So this is the most unofficial border crossing I have ever done. Uh, I've just crossed the fence to uh, Argentina. Um, it's been raining like the whole day, so it's very wet. And it's 20 kilometers like this until the border crossing or the Duana, Argentina. God. This is deep. This is fucking deep. I'm not sure if I have to cross here or I think I have to. My toes are freezing. Water is near freezing temperature. I go. Oh man, I'm so tired. So many times that I lost the trail, pushing through those big bushes. So it's been uh, tough and it's been raining all the time. I just ate something and uh, found the bridge right there.
run, boy. So I made it to the other side and the Argentinian gendarmeria were very nice. They let me sleep inside on one of their bunk beds and uh, gave me a meal and I could try my stuff there. It was really amazing. They never meet people there. There's nobody coming there, especially in winter. And um, I was lucky that they were resupplied the next day, so I could hitch a ride with the uh, with the other gendarmerie, yes, uh, back to the main road. We were still like, what, about 70 kilometers further through no man's land and flooded roads and rivers. It was crazy, it was so much rain and which turned into snow the next day. So I was in the back of this army truck with some plates of corrugated steel on my <laughs> lap. It was a crazy ride. Imagine to cross this with the bike. Yeah. La Oteria? Is that Ah, okay. So I thanked the guys and I moved on my way. I camped somewhere along the road and after that it was drier because this is the Argentinian Pampa, which is sort of a desert known for its relentless winds but that's mostly in summer uh, in winter it's a lot more quiet down there uh, it's cold but it's easy cycling it's just smooth roads and i was just cruising down towards the south Perfect view. I'm so happy to camp here. This is just outside the park. the journey was sort of a blur I mean you know you reach the end and it's Ushuaia sort of the quiet end of the line there's not much happening there it's uh, there's winter sports there but I had no plan to do anything touristic 
So I just arrived there and I started packing and I needed to, I needed to get out of there. I wanted to go home. I wanted to rest. I wanted to process everything, the whole journey. I wanted to see my family. The journey needed to stop and uh, I was glad to finish it. I would be happy about it a bit later. Um, once I was starting to look back to this beautiful journey, this beautiful memory, they, those are the best days, the best years of my life. They've given me so much, so many friendships, so many experiences, so many beautiful things that I've seen. Um, it brought me just to the next level in my life. You know, because I believe life is a series of events and one thing leads to another. And for me, that probably started when I quit my job 12 years ago, which is already a long time, which is very scary at the time. And I didn't know how things were going to work out, but I started freelancing and I write in the preface in more detail about this series of events that led to my bike journey. And I probably wouldn't have bought these cabins in, it, in Italy, in the mountains, without this bike journey because it told me to, uh, that I enjoy living outside and more connected with nature. You know, so I think everything is connected. You know, if you do something scary today, you'll get creative and you'll, tomorrow you'll be inspired and you'll find solutions and you move on from that. And if you do nothing today, uh, tomorrow will be exactly the same, right? So, thanks for buying the book. The signed editions have, have all been sold out, but it's available uh, on Amazon and different web shops. So, thanks again for watching the series, and I'll be heading on with the cabins. There's a lot of work to do. It's snowing right now, um, but I guess I'll see you soon. Ciao!